verses are cut it off a little bit. But obviously, as we're going to be seeing, those last few verses really are germane to what I want to talk about uh, this evening. Good evening, everyone. Evening. So, Brenda, what year was it you graduated? I mean, if you're an alumni. <laughs> A lot of things. We've had an interesting day. It was an interesting morning because of what we did in the format, and I realized that most everybody was here. A few of you were not, but as we had kind of the drill and so forth for emergency situations, and uh, it was uh, kind of a, a, an odd situation from the standpoint of uh, abbreviating our services, and, and uh, Roger told me that he was very happy, first of all, that I had talked to some of our guests beforehand, told them what was going on, in case they were wondering why, you know, we sing so very few verses to the songs that we have. Our, our singing tonight, we sang twice as many verses tonight as we sang this morning, just already, just about. And furthermore, uh, to uh, just to abbreviate everything as we did, the other thing Roger and Francie said, that I can make up before I want and preach a much longer sermon tonight if I want. I mean, but it just seems like they're the only ones that ever make that recommendation. <laughs> But it is so good to see everybody here tonight. I, I want to just begin with a story, an illustration. And in the days, think back of many years ago, when an ice cream sundae cost much less than today, there was a 10-year-old boy that entered into a hotel coffee shop, and he sat at a table all by himself. And in that situation, a waitress comes up to him and puts a glass of water on the table in front of him. The little boy looked up at her and he asked, how much is an ice cream sundae? And her response will show you how old this story is because I want to make the point, and she said 50 cents. The little boy pulled his hand out of his pocket and he had changed, and he studied the coins that he had. Then he looked up and he says, well, how much is a dish of plain vanilla ice cream? Now, by this time, there were several people that were waiting to get a table, and most, most likely were staying at the hotel, waiting for an available table, and the wait, waitress obviously is growing a little impatient with this 10 year old but in answer to this question well how much just for a dish of plain vanilla ice cream she kind of harshly replied 35 cents the little boy carefully counted his coins and said i'll have the plain vanilla ice cream well in just a matter of moments the waitress brought to the little boy the ice cream and when she set it down she put the bill on the table as well. And the little boy, he finished his ice cream, took the bill, got up, and he went toward the front doors, the restaurant, the cafe, and he paid the cashier and left. When the waitress came back, it was then that she noticed that there was placed neatly beside the empty dish two nickels and five pennies. He had left her a 15 cent tip. And she came to understand that he had the 50 cents to buy the Sunday, but if he would do that, he would not have enough money to leave her a tip. Obviously, a young boy that was trained well, I might ask, or say, he didn't have enough, and so he got what he could so that he could show, still show his appreciation for what he had received. Now, I can think of several valuable lessons that I believe would be important to us in this little story. One of the things I think that would be very important is that we should not make quick judgments about people especially until you know all the facts. The waitress learned this the hard way. She had made some judgments in reference to what was going on. 
a passage of scripture that has been very important to me and that when I have tried to exercise the wisdom to use it in various circumstances of this life, excuse me, is Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it is a folly and a shame unto him. How many times do we find ourselves making judgments when we don't have all the available facts? Only to later understand and discover that we made too quick of a judgment, too rash or harsh of a judgment. And then we feel perhaps even embarrassed by what we said or by what we did. I think that's an important lesson from that little story, but certainly the scriptural principle that is seen. Something else that I think that is important in this little story is being willing to make certain sacrifices in order to do the right thing. She may have been harsh with him. She may have been showing or exhibiting some impatience. But regardless of what her attitude was, he had already made up his mind that he was going to do the right thing. That he knew that the right thing, the appropriate thing was, is that you tip someone. He's willing to do that, and that's all about self-sacrifice. How often do we talk about passages that deal with sacrificing self? Even in Romans 12, 1, to give ourselves our bodies as a living sacrifice, but we should have that sacrificial mindset that even if it is going to involve sacrifice or something that is uncomfortable or difficult, we're going to do it because it's what's right. I think that's a valuable lesson. I think another important lesson is that people in humble circumstances, and this little boy, he was in humble circumstances that he had a limited amount of money. But people in humble circumstances can often teach us much of what we're ready to learn. That maybe we think, no, those who do the teaching are those that are those that are the privileged, or those that are the educated, or those that are the wealthy, or those that are in, in great position or stations in life. But you know what? How many times do we find people in humble circumstances because of their attitude or because of their actions? They teach us the valuable lessons. That takes humility on our part. The wise man also said, speaking of the Proverbs, but a couple of chapters earlier in Proverbs 16 and verse 19, better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly, with the lowly, than to divide the spoil of the proud. We can learn from people of humble circumstances. And then finally, as far as some of the observations that we can make, how about the very thing that Jesus said, as Paul quotes it in Acts 20, verse 35, he says, for when the Lord Jesus said, it is more blessed, what? To give than to receive. That's how he looked at it. Because comparatively speaking, and Tim's probably already done the math, he's this kind of a guy. I knew it. I knew it! It's a 43% tip, isn't it? It's more blessed to give than to receive. And evidently when he walked out the door, he had nothing left in his pocket. But the lesson that I really want to emphasize is something that this young man evidently was taught. And something that were to be taught and that's actually being grateful for great servants. Now, we may look at her and say, well, she didn't seem to be a great servant because maybe she was a little harsh or she was impatient or whatever. But you know what? With him, it didn't make any difference. He's going to show appreciation. He was served. He got what he asked for. He paid for that. And then he was going to show his appreciation. The real lesson that I want to talk about is, is showing that kind of appreciation about those that will be servants. Jason Eatman came up to me right before services started as he, was, as he did the scripture reading tonight. And Jason said, you know, looking at the various translations and even in the parallel passages of this great account in Mark 10 dealing with the sons of Zebedee, 
who are also referred to as what? As the sons of thunder. And Jesus said, you know, that's pretty, they were pretty bold. They were pretty bold. And do you think, they come up to Jesus and they have a request of Jesus that they have something that they want Jesus to do for them. And I mean, they ask it straight out boldly. And they had to learn a lesson in humility themselves. And, and, and one reason I, obviously, the reason why I wanted him to finish that, just look at that text again, if you would, in Mark chapter 10. And, and drop on down where after they've asked them, and in verse 30, asked Jesus, in verse 38, Jesus said, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? Now, let me first of all ask you, that when he says to them, to James and John, are you willing, are you ready to drink a cup to be baptized? What was he talking about? He's talking about a cup of suffering, isn't he? And in baptism, what was he talking about? An immersion or overwhelming of this suffering. Very metaphor, very much a figure of speech. Now, they thought that they were ready, and they were better proved to be ready, because I find it very interesting. Think about James and John, the apostles. Let me ask you, who was the first apostle to be martyred? James, exactly, in Acts chapter 12. Early on, James is killed by, as the scripture says, Luke says, the sword of Herod. Who is the last Apostle to die. John was. And John evidently died not of martyrdom, but just of old age. But I've often, often thought about that. And we've talked about this in times past. Can you imagine as John, through those years of hearing about his fellow disciples, his fellow apostles, and of course, how he must have felt to begin with when his brother, when his blood brother John, a James brother, James was martyred in, in Acts chapter 12, how he must have felt about that. What do you suppose his feelings would be when he gets this information that the Apostle Paul is in prison and eventually beheaded? What would go through the mind of this aged John that he hears that Peter is now finally in Rome, but he's going to be executed and he's going to be crucified but head down as he was and died. Whereas he gets the information of the apostles the various places that they went and the report comes back one after one have died. And he sees all that's going on with the church and apostasy. I want to tell you that in itself is a type of persecution that would be very, very difficult to endure. So these fellows are very interesting to me. And yes, in the boldness of the question that they, they asked. But Jesus said to them in verse 39, when after they said we were able, Jesus said, the cup that I drink you will drink and be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. You will be baptized. And all of these apostles, they would suffer great hardship being apostles, being apostles of Christ. And then there's this problem of when the other apostles heard this request, the other ten, in verse 41, and when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, uh, over them. But notice verse 43. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave or servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I think the lesson is clear enough. And that Jesus is preparing these men to become great servants. Yes, they're apostles. Yes, the Holy Spirit is going to guide them into all truth. Yes, they are going to occupy this incredible place 
In the history of Christianity, with the beginning of the church, the growth and development of the New Testament church, and we look at them, and these apostles were, they were good men, without question, and we have a tendency to really elevate them because of the position that they had. But what Jesus wants them to understand, that what they needed to be more than anything, was to be great servants. To serve the needs of others. And brethren, what I want us to understand is that when we see that there are those that serve others in that unselfish, selfless way to serve others, especially our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, it is here that we need to be grateful for great servants. That should always be our attitude. Not to take people, these servants, for granted. Jesus said, whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Greatness had nothing to do with the title. And it never has and never will. It has nothing to do with title apostle. Nothing to do with title of elder or title of evangelist. It has nothing to do with title of deacon. Even though the word deacon means servant. But what has everything to do is, is people, men and women, who in such an unselfish way that understand the importance of the role in the kingdom of God will step up and say, I want to serve. I want to serve God. I want to serve my brethren. I want to even the best I can as a Christian and from a Christian perspective, serve my community. Leaving that situation and going for some period of time, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote his first letter to the church at Thessalonica, and in 1 Thessalonians, Paul there shares and he writes of his incredible appreciation for these brethren, of what had become known of them, who they were, what they were doing, the impact that they were having the body of Christ, and on their world around them, there in northern Greece, Macedonia, where Thessalonica was. And when Paul wrote to the Thessalonian brethren, in expressing his appreciation for their work, you will read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2-4, through 4, listen to it carefully, and Paul says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayer. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, of our God and Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Paul is expressing the very best that he can, his appreciation for these brethren, making mention of them in his prayers all of the time. Remembering without Ceasing, it says, their work of faith, their labor of love, their patience of hope, because it was work, it was laborious, and because of their time and circumstances, with persecution and difficulties, those kinds of challenges, it takes patience, you know. Brethren, I hope that we understand and appreciate that we are blessed with a good number of people, I believe, that are willing to serve God and that are willing to serve this congregation and willing to serve one another here as brethren. And so I want us to talk about that, to be thinking about that. It's important to want to make it. It all begins really when you think about the willing to serve attitude. This is what we must have ourselves that every one of us must have this willing to serve attitude. So yes, we want to show great appreciation for those that serve, but what I want to challenge every one of us is do we have that willing to serve attitude ourselves? Remember Jesus said, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And it is here that we learn from the example of Jesus. A couple of texts that stand out 
And you know these texts, but would you take your Bibles and turn over to Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2. Just read, let's first read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And there when the Apostle Paul challenges the church at Philippi, he says, let this mind, this is Philippians 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Jesus had no misunderstanding or misgivings about who he was and what he became he, he, to become flesh and come to this earth. He, being in the form of God, did not consider Robert to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became, obe became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. You know, as we would just analyze that passage, it all begins with a mindset or an attitude, doesn't it? That's what verse 5 is saying. Your mind, some of the freer translation says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. This mind, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Your attitude. We can learn from Jesus about that attitude. Every one of us, brethren, can serve. We can serve. We can serve the needs of this congregation, the needs of our brethren, the spiritual needs of this community. And even in many respects, because we're Christians, even some of the physical and material needs. We can do that. And learn from Jesus that that's what he did. Verse 7 says, But he made himself nothing. One of the translators said, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. The sinless, perfect son of God made himself a servant, a bond servant, a slave. Why? To serve the needs of others. Verse 8 is probably the key because it says he humbled himself. What he did and the way he did it is that he lowered himself. He humbled himself. And if we're going to be the servants that we need to be, and the church is always going to need these kinds of servants, we've got to be willing to lower ourselves, to humble ourselves, to make those commitments, those sacrifices, to become more aware of what the needs are. And I think one of the greatest lessons of which he showed that, how he lowered himself and be a, be a servant, was a servant, and what he wanted his own apostles to understand would take us right to John 13, back in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, when he washed the disciples' feet. Let's just read verses 12 through 17. A good part of the chapter deals with the whole setting, what happened there. But I just look in chapter 13 of John, John 13, and drop on down to verse number 12. And at 12 it says, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for I, so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater, nor is he who sent is greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. We often talk about that scenario and what happened and as he's washing the disciples' feet and the immediate impetuous reaction of, of, of Peter that says, no, I have nothing to do with this. That he did not want his master washing his feet. That he was the master and that the master doesn't need to be doing such a lowly thing. And, and, and Jesus has to explain to Peter, Peter, mentally, intellectually, emotionally, you've got this thing backwards. What made him such a great master, that is Jesus, what made him such a great master was because he lowered himself and because he served others. 
the church should not be filled with those people that are in positions of, of, of leadership to come walking and prancing in as though they're going to be served and they're going to be honored and they're the ones that are going to be considered as, as the dignified ones of the congregation. They are the ones who should be the most lowly, the most humble, and those that are filled with the greatest desire to serve, as Jesus did. He said in verse 15 of our reading, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. He said in verse 16, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. And there should always be even a sense of that we are one in Christ and that there's an equality amongst us all. But it's a whole matter of this mindset again, learning from Jesus that what it means to be a servant and to even lead from the position of being a servant. And so Jesus says in conclusion to them in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed, there's the consummate blessing, the bliss, the real happiness or satisfaction, if you will. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. My friends, as I just make some closing thoughts, thankful disciples of Jesus should not have to be begged to serve in accordance to the ability and to the opportunity that the Lord has given That as servants, we should not have to be begged to serve our Lord and to serve others. He has given to each and every one of us ability. He has given to each and every one of us opportunity. The Lord has given that to us. And we should have that wonderful, wonderful spirit of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 5, we understand the fact as you look at the first several chapters in the book of Isaiah, what's going to be soon portrayed is that Israel is looking at hardship. It is a mess. It is like a vineyard that is not a good vineyard, a vineyard of which the Lord is going to lay waste. And somebody needs to tell Israel what the problem is. It was so bad, that's what we often quote Isaiah 5.20, Woe to them that call good evil, evil good. Many of us are familiar with that passage. That here even the people of God were reversing what's good and what's bad. And so God knows that this is going to be quite a chore. And so you have kind of this picture of deity speaking. Who shall we send to warn Israel of this? And we find in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. What does Isaiah stand up and say? Here am I. Send me. Lord, send me. Do we have that in our book? I don't even know if we do. But Lord, here am I. Send me. My friends, that's the willing to serve attitude that we have. And, and, and this is for every one of us. This isn't just for a select group or two within the congregation. Whatever that would be, because we shouldn't even kind of we shouldn't even segment ourselves that way. And that while yes, we have elders and we have deacons and we have Bible class teachers, we have song leaders, we have those that can do a lot of different things, even when it comes to the public worship. And there's so much work that needs to be done. We don't even segment it. What we do is we understand that we all have ability, we all have opportunity. And our abilities may differ. Our opportunities might even come at different times. But I want to ask, do we have ability and do we have opportunity to be these kinds of servants of God? Do we? I'm asking, do we? Here am I. Send me. So the final lesson is this. There's a lot of points there with a lot of scriptures. I realize that. That's just kind of for your own referencing and knowing because what I want to talk about is those who serve. I just want to close in talking about those who serve because what this lesson is all about, this lesson is about being grateful for great servants. And this congregation is blessed with a good number 
of people that are willing to serve not just what they can do, but even beyond and go the extra mile. But I tell you, that should be the attitude. And I realize that I'm speaking to so many of our, our mature Christians. You're, you're back tonight. You're here. You're, you're, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment as well. But I want us to see, to see is that all of us, as I speak to this nucleus, as I speak to this core, as I speak to people that obviously care and that want to worship God and want to be involved in a, a fellowship with God's people, but when we look at the various needs that are found in the congregation, that we should always be looking and saying, what can I do? How can I step up? And never assume, well, it's going to be done because somebody else is going to do it. Do you suppose that that's a common challenge or problem that is probably found in most congregations? Do you think it is? I know that when we talk about physical needs, and even when it comes to the needs of, of this congregation, I mean, communion preparation. Do we take it for granted? I, I hope not. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pointing out a couple of people individually. There's a couple of people that I said, don't in fact, I'll get there in a moment, with some that actually left town today. And I thought, well, that's good and that's bad. Because I wanted to talk about them anyway. So it's always more fun to talk about them when they're not here. But anyway. How many of us in this congregation actually know that who, like 99.9% .9 of the time, how many in this congregation know that who takes care of the Lord's Supper, the preparing this, the getting it out here and cleaning up, how many people in this congregation know who that is? All right. Does that know who that is? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I can say? Just thank you. And I thought about that the other day. I thought, I don't know if it's, if it may be ever. I don't know that if I've ever gone up to Zach and said, Zach, and I don't wish to embarrass Zach, and it not bother me if I do, but I'm just saying, <laughs> but I'm, it's not my intent to, to, but I don't know that I've ever gone up and said, Zach Barkas, thank you for doing that. And there are going to be some things that, that perhaps, in, and I don't even know if we do this anymore, I'm one of the elders. Is there any compensation for that? No? Okay. All right. In times past, there has been, actually. In times past, there has been. No compensation. Zach thinks. We should never take for granted that does, do these things need to take place and happen? You know, when it's not done right, and I've seen it in places because I've been in a couple places one situation I can remember that happened more, more than once, well, I come walking into the building on Tuesday, because I always take one's Mondays off, rather, and they come on Tuesday, and stuff is still there, or maybe left in the preparation room. And it doesn't take, especially if it's warm weather, where things get a little yucky. How many people know in this congregation that what really is going on with the cleaning of this building every week? How many in this congregation know who's cleaning this building every week? And they're not here. And the one principally is Dennis. Now there is some compensation, but I'm just going to tell you about this. And, and this is one of these things that's good for us, it's good for them, but it ain't a whole lot. As I look at that, and, and we've had so many people that have volunteered through the years, and we, we try to thank you for that. I remember times when Earl was an elder, and he would go through occasionally and thank people for what they would do. And I think about that, and, but I want to tell you, when, when I come in, and Dennis, when Dennis comes in and cleans this building, that man spends hours here every week. I, I mean, I guess he's had some professional experience, right? But the point is, if we think that, well, yes, he should do a good job. Well, of course, anybody's going to do something, he should do a good job. But because of all this little compensation, I want to tell you that he goes beyond. How many know that while we have a landscaper doing some things, but do you realize that while they kind of trim the, the shrubs and kind of clean things up, how many know of who has been involved in really, really keep see my hand knows, who really takes care of the art or, or, and through the years have done so much? And I'll tell you what, who we have to thank for that for a long time. And he's kind of finally retired because you know, he's 91 years old, but he's back doing it again. And you know why? 
Well, because somebody else was going to do it, but that just wasn't going to be convenient. And so the 91-year-old Jack for shares is back doing it. 91 years old. I tell him all the time, Jack, you're probably going to outlive us all in anyway. But thank you. And there's others that have helped with, with that, obviously. You see the point I'm talking about. You know, in the assistant deal, and you know, I've got all these passages, even when they had to prepare for the Passover in Mark 14, kind of like getting things ready for the Lord's Supper. And, and you know, you've got all of these things, the building needs and, and all of those kinds of things, and, and assisting the elderly, the widows, the sick. How many times do we talk about James 1.27, that pure and undefiled before religion, before God fathers this, to, to care for those orphans and widows. And I want to tell you, there are those that do that. And I'm glad that he, he already left for Arizona this afternoon, Paul O'Connor. But I don't know, for Paul O'Connor, and from Carol Johnson to Esther Smith, and even my mother-in-law the other day, as far as, you know what he's, you look at this, and again, it's not the point of trying to embarrass anybody or try to, but I'm saying is that you look at this and there are so many of those kinds of things that all of us can be doing. And then when it comes to the spiritual needs, and we're always going to have the need for teachers, Bible class teachers, you know, we, we, and we have the Bible class teachers and the need from our, from our kids, our younger ages, the adult classes, and so forth. And, and we have this core of teachers, and of course now what's been happening, Earl and I for a long time, we get together every summer. Now Tim Barkas and Tom Hume, I believe, have been mainly doing that and putting that together. And all I can say to these teachers for that will teach our children, and it's not easy, and it's painstaking, and it's, it's, it's a sacrifice of time, and, and, and some of their, these teachers do such an amazing job, and we should say thank you. But again, how important teaching is. But then beyond just here, how about when we look at the needs, and, and, and I want to tell you that there's so many of us that have ability and opportunity to open our homes and to have Bible classes in our homes. And it doesn't have to go on for, for 28 years like the Tuesday night class has been going. Although if you are more than, if you would be willing to sponsor that for a while on a Tuesday night, Tim and Ellen Barkas probably would say, oh, we'd let you. I don't know how long we've been going to the Barkas house now on Tuesday nights for Bible class, or, or how about having the opportunity to, to go and to be a part of that class? Uh, the old two have been sponsoring the house in Cambria. For, and I'm going to tell you what, how fantastic that was that for so long, there were times we'd have 20 to 25 people in that class in their home. In their little living room, their beautiful, modest little home up there in the Cambria Pines. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We take the time to involve, to participate, but take the time for those that serve and thank them. Are given with liberality. We're blessed. We're blessed from God. And I'll tell you, it's just, again, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. We go right back to Acts 20 and verse 35. But it's one of the gifts that's addressed in Romans chapter 12. And when we have that ability, and we have so much ability because of our jobs, because of, of how God has blessed us to live, where we live, when we live, the jobs that we have, the homes that we live in, the cars that we drive, the things that we have, the abilities that we just have. I mean, if it's to go on vacation, if it is to do travels, if it's, are we a blessed people? And to those that give even beyond. And it's a good thing. I'll tell you right now, it's a good thing. Because not everybody is. Just as there should be more involved in teaching, going to classes like Tuesday or Thursday, or sponsoring classes in their home. 
as we're always going to be need for grooming leaders of teachers and elders and deacons for the future, these needs will never end. That we're always going to need brethren that are willing to, to do what? To encourage others, to encourage and to exhort one another. To do that, the whole First Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore comfort each other and edify just as you are doing. Edify one another just as you are doing. We're always going to have those needs. And then obviously I say to you all, but especially here to a Sunday night crowd, and faithful attendants who understand what it means to motivate and stir up love and good works, and not to forsake the assembly, but, but to exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, all I can say to, to you in your faithful, untiring attendance, thank you. Because it's what really helps to solidify the growth and the strength and the future the viability of a congregation. Do you believe that? Again, to all those who regularly, diligently, and faithfully serve this congregation, thank you, thank you, thank you. And if it was appropriate to tip you, I would. I don't know about 43%, but no. You are members that keep the church going and hopefully secure the future. I close with this. You've been very, very patient with this. But here's the challenge. If the congregation was made up entirely of members like me, this is every one of us, and you take this very personal. If the congregation was made up entirely of members like me, would it, the congregation excel and flourish as it should? Is that a fair question? And if people think that's not a fair question, then all I have to say is go back and check it out. The thoughtfulness of a little boy, the action of that little boy, left a lasting impression on a waitress. And she probably reflected on the situation. And I'm sure that there have been situations like that where lessons were learned. But let us remember those who serve and be grateful and then let all of us become those kinds of great servants as well. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We can help them in making a decision for Christ, bettering their position and their relationship with God. We extend you the invitation to tonight, whatever that need may be. Won't you come as we stand as we sing.